King Lear by William Shakespeare. Hi, I'm Cecilia Lesvarlin, and this is a video in my series Learn from the Classics of Literature. In some of the videos in this series, we will learn from the incomparable Shakespeare. Twelve of Shakespeare's greatest plays have been summarized into beautiful groundbreaking short stories by the British poet and novelist Edith Nesbitt. And these short stories have been recorded by great LibriVox readers. One of these exquisite short stories is King Lear by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. King Lear King Lear was old and tired. He was a weary of the business of his kingdom, and wished only to end his days quietly near his three daughters, whom he loved dearly. Two of his daughters were married to the Dukes of Albany and Cornwall, and the Duke of Burgundy and the King of France were both staying at Lear's court as suitors for the hand of Cordelia, his youngest daughter. Lear called his three daughters together, and told them that he proposed to divide his kingdom between them. "'But first, said he, I should like to know how much you love me." Goneril, who was really a very wicked woman, and did not love her father at all, said she loved him more than words could say. She loved him dearer than eyesight, space, or liberty, more than life, grace, health, beauty, and honour. "'If you love me as much as this,' said the king, "'I give you a third part of my kingdom. And how much does Regan love me?' I love you as much as my sister, and more," professed Regan, since I care for nothing but my father's love. Lear was very much pleased with Regan's professions, and gave her another third part of his fair kingdom. Then he turned his youngest daughter Cordelia. "'Now our joy, though last not least,' he said, "'the best part of my kingdom have I kept for you. What can you say?' "'Nothing, my lord.' answered Cordelia. "'Nothing?' "'Nothing,' said Cordelia. "'Nothing can come of nothing. Speak again,' said the king. And Cordelia answered, "'I love your majesty according to my duty, no more, no less.' And this she said, because she knew her sister's wicked hearts, and was disgusted with the way in which they professed unbounded and impossible love, when really they had not even a right sense of duty to their old father. "'I am your daughter,' she went on, "'and you have brought me up and loved me, and I return you those duties back as are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honour you.' Lear, who loved Cordelia best, had wished her to make more extravagant professions of love than her sisters, and what seemed to him her coldness so angered him that he bade her be gone from his sight. "'Go,' he said, "'be for ever a stranger to my heart and me.' The Earl of Kent, one of Lear's favourite courtiers and captains, tried to say a word for Cordelia's sake, but Lear would not listen. He divided the remaining part of his kingdom between Goneril and Regan, who had pleased him with their foolish flattery, and told them that he should only keep a hundred knights at arms for his following, and would live with his daughters by turns. When the Duke of Burgundy knew that Cordelia would have no share of the kingdom, he gave up his courtship of her. But the King of France was wiser, and said to her, Fairest Cordelia, thou art most rich being poor most choice forsaken, and most loved despised. Thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Thy dowerless daughter-king is queen of us, of ours and our fair France." "'Take her, take her,' said the king, "'for I have no such daughter, and will never see that face of hers again.' So Cordelia became Queen of France, and the Earl of Kent, for having ventured to take her part, was banished from the King's court and from the kingdom. The King now went to stay with his daughter Goneril, and very soon began to find out how much fair words were worth. She had got everything from her father that he had to give, and she began to grudge even the hundred knights that he had reserved for himself. She frowned at him whenever she met him, she herself was harsh and undutiful to him, and her servants treated him with neglect, and either refused to obey his orders, or pretended that they did not hear them. 
Now the Earl of Kent, when he was banished, made as though he would go into another country, but instead he came back in the disguise of a serving-man and took service with the King, who never suspected him to be that Earl of Kent whom he himself had banished. The very same day that Lear engaged him as his servant, Goneril's steward insulted the King, and the Earl of Kent showed his respect for the King's majesty by tripping up the caitiff into the gutter. The King had now two friends, the Earl of Kent, whom he only knew as his servant, and his fool, who was faithful to him although he had given away his kingdom. Goneril was not contented with letting her father suffer insults at the hands of her servants. She told him plainly that his train of one hundred knights only served to fill her court with riot and feasting, and so she begged him to dismiss them, and only keep a few old men about him, such as himself. "'My train are men who know all parts of duty,' said Lear. "'Saddle my horses, call my train together. Goneril, I will not trouble you further. Yet I have left another daughter." And he cursed his daughter Goneril, praying that she might never have a child, or that if she had, it might treat her as cruelly as she had treated him. And his horses being saddled, he set out with his followers for the castle of Regan, his other daughter. Lear sent on his servant Caius, who was really the Earl of Kent, with letters to his daughter to say that he was coming. But Caius fell in with a messenger of Goneril, in fact that very steward whom he had tripped into the gutter, and beat him soundly for the mischief-maker that he was. And Regan, when she heard it, put Caius in the stocks, not respecting him as a messenger coming from her father. And she who had formerly outdone her sister in professions of attachment to the king, now seemed to outdo her in undutiful conduct, saying that fifty knights were too many to wait on him, that five and twenty were enough. And Goneril, who had hurried thither to prevent Regan showing any kindness to the old king, said five and twenty were too many, or even ten, or even five, since her servants could wait on him. "'What need one?' said Regan. Then, when Lear saw that what they really wanted was to drive him away from them, he cursed them both and left them. It was a wild and stormy night, yet those cruel daughters did not care what became of their father in the cold and the rain, but they shut the castle doors and went in out of the storm. All night he wandered about the heath half mad with misery, and with no companion but the poor fool. But presently his servant Caius, the good Earl of Kent, met him, and at last persuaded him to lie down in a wretched little hovel which stood upon the heath. At daybreak the Earl of Kent removed his royal master to Dover, where his old friends were, and then hurried to the court of France, and told Cordelia what had happened. Her husband gave her an army to go to the assistance of her father, and with it she landed at Dover. Here she found poor King Lear, now quite mad, wandering about the fields, singing aloud to himself and wearing a crown of nettles and weeds. They brought him back and fed and clothed him, and the doctors gave him such medicines as they thought might bring him back to his right mind, and by and by he woke better, but still not quite himself. Then Cordelia came to him and kissed him, to make up, as she said, for her sisters. At first he hardly knew her. "'Pray, do not mock me,' he said. "'I am a very foolish, fond old man, fourscore and upward, and to deal plainly I fear I am not in my perfect mind. I think I should know you, though I do not know these garments, nor do I know where I lodged last night. Do not laugh at me, though as I am a man, I think this lady must be my daughter, Cordelia." "'And so I am, I am!' cried Cordelia. "'Come with me.' "'You must bear with me,' said Lear. "'Forget and forgive. I am old and foolish.' And now he knew at last which of his children it was that had loved him best, and who was worthy of his love, and from that time they were not parted. Goneril and Regan joined their armies to fight Cordelia's army, and were successful, and Cordelia and her father were thrown into prison. Then Goneril's husband, the Duke of Albany, who was a good man, and had not known how wicked his wife was, heard the truth of the whole story, and when Goneril found that her husband knew her for the wicked woman she was, she killed herself, having a little time before given a deadly poison to her sister Regan, out of a spirit of jealousy. But they had arranged that Cordelia should be hanged in prison, and though the Duke of Albany sent messengers at once, it was too late. The old king came staggering into the tent of the Duke of Albany, carrying the body of his dear daughter Cordelia in his arms. "'Oh, she is gone for ever,' he said. 
I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth." They crowded round in horror. "'Oh, if she lives,' said the King, "'it is a chance that does redeem all sorrows that I have ever left.' The Earl of Kent spoke a word to him, but Lear was too mad to listen. "'A plague upon you murderous traitors all! I might have saved her. Now she is gone for ever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little! Her voice was ever low, gentle and soft, an excellent thing in woman. I killed the slave that was hanging thee." "'Tis true, my lords, he did," said one of the officers from the castle. "'Oh, thou wilt come no more!' cried the poor old man. "'Do you see this? Look on her! Look, her lips! Look there! Look there!" And with that he fell with her still in his arms, and died. And this was the end of Lear and Cordelia.